Hey everyone, welcome back to another mini-sode of the Ethical Consumer Podcast. I'm your host, Julia, and today I will be talking about carbon neutral. What does carbon neutral mean? What does it mean when a business is trying to go or achieves carbon neutrality? And how you can approach carbon neutrality in your own life as well. So let's look at the phrase, carbon neutral. Neutral not being positive, not being negative, but ideally hitting an even balance. This is the balance of carbon that is being emitted and also carbon that is being reduced. In most cases, we're talking about carbon dioxide and also carbon emissions from things like power plants. And not dissimilar to food and beverage companies and restaurants wanting to advertise and implement organic and non-GMO practices, carbon neutral is another declaration that a company is doing their job to preserve the future of our environment. Now, sometimes this means they are regulating their practices so that they are producing less carbon. And sometimes this means they're also spending money in ways that help offset the amount of carbon that they are still creating. Technology is still catching up as far as reducing the reliance on carbon emissions for fuel, for energy, and also the technology is still building. I think it's really starting to gain a lot of steam with a lot of cities, a lot of states, and again, like I mentioned in a few episodes ago, airlines catching on and supporting and funding carbon removal. And frequently these are used in combination. A company could just pay a bunch of money and offset the amount of carbon that they're producing, but that's not really ideal for them either. A company could also try to not produce any carbon at all, completely offsetting with solar panels, not allowing plastic wrappers, not allowing garbage, making sure employees bike to work. You know, it's that's a little hard. So the idea that you can offset your carbon emissions is pretty helpful. It would, in a perfect world, guys, in a perfect world, everybody would be able to bike to work, no trash would be created, and everything would be solar and wind powered. But unfortunately, that's just not the way it is right now. And like I mentioned before, carbon neutrality is, does not necessarily mean that this includes all greenhouse gases. I will be talking about climate neutral in the next mini-sode coming out next Thursday. But carbon neutral is extremely important as carbon dioxide accounts for around 80% of all emissions. This is also one of the easier things to offset because we do have ways of using renewable energy and reducing our footprint by traveling less, buying less, packaging less. And this is where consumers can also start to reduce their carbon footprint. We've had a few guests so far that have been carbon neutral and I'm excited to see who else comes on in the future that also has gained carbon neutrality and maybe even climate neutrality. But what can you do? Businesses are gonna take a little while. There's a lot to consider when you are producing something. How can we lessen our carbon footprint as consumers? Part of this does go into knowing who you're supporting, what you're buying, looking for these carbon neutral businesses, looking for even climate neutral businesses and supporting them so that they have more income, more funding in order to keep going in that direction. I think two of the easiest things to think about are what we're doing on a daily basis. If we're buying local, if we're using ride sharing, if we're taking public transportation, this cuts down on the individual journeys. <laughs> How do I say this in the best way? I am comparing two different things, transportation of humans and transportation of produce and consumer packaged goods. When you're taking public transportation, that bus route, that metro line, that's gonna go regardless of how many people are on it. You might as well take it and not contribute by driving your car. However, here's the problem where not every location is going to have a consistent and convenient enough bus route. I do not have a subway. I do not have a metro where I live. And unfortunately, the bus only runs every hour. It also does not run extremely early. It does not run extremely late. So public transportation is not used frequently where I am living. So most people drive their cars. A lot of people also bike. I am proud to live in a bike friendly community. And that is something that I am looking forward to riding my bike to work. Now let's talk about that in terms of food. If you're going to a local store and purchasing 
produce or purchasing a consumer packaged good or ideally going to a farmer's market and purchasing it straight from that grower, that seller. That food was already going to be on that shelf. It didn't have to take an extra trip to get to your doorstep. However, yeah, it took a trip, who knows how far, from which country in certain cases for certain types of produce. Uh, I've mentioned before, I live in Iowa. Uh, my mother's actually growing a pineapple in her greenhouse right now, but let me tell you, there aren't many pineapple farms in Iowa. So when I buy pineapple at the grocery store, usually it says product of Chile or something of that nature. I don't actually remember where my pineapples come from. Naughty, bad self. No, not bad self. To get pineapples in Iowa, you know they're not grown in the Midwest. But buying and supporting local as much as you can, and if you have public transportation that you can use, two of the easiest things you can do. Another easy thing that I find would be just being aware of what energy you're using in your home. Are you turning off the lights? Are you turning off the water? You know, these are things that have been ingrained into our brains since we were how old? Turn off the light, turn off, take shorter showers. It really does make a difference. Now, things that I think are a little more challenging are going to be the types of food that you're eating. A few years ago, Meatless Mondays really started to gain popularity. This is for those who still want to eat meat, but also are aware that meat consumption is not necessarily the best for the environment. Some also decided to do it for dietary restrictions, and I think it's a really easy way to play with eating less meat. Maybe you're used to just having meat, potatoes, cheese, you know, the classic Midwestern diet. And it's gonna take a lot of energy, a lot of concentration, and it seems really challenging to just start eating less meat across the board. One meal, one dinner, start with one dinner, then maybe start with dinner and lunch. We don't have to strive for perfection. We don't have to go cold turkey on anything, just work at getting a little bit better every single day, every week, every month. And it's a lot easier and a lot more enjoyable than just going cold turkey on anything. In addition to quality and type of food, I would also put fashion in that next category. It requires a little more thought. It requires a little more effort to change some habits that you've had Maybe you're used to going shopping every weekend and just picking up things you like and then all of a sudden you have a closet full of clothes that you never wear. Well, I think we can agree that most of those purchases were not the most necessary, but it can be fun to some people to go shopping to buy things. Just limit it. Notice what you're buying. Is that something that you're gonna buy and use? Repeatedly, is this gonna last over a couple seasons or are you gonna wear this once, maybe twice? If you need something for a special event, is it possible to borrow something from a friend that already has it? Maybe they only wore it once or twice and it's just sitting in their closet. Get some use out of their garments. The garment industry can be really questionable, uh, especially when you consider how quickly brands try to catch on to trends and how quickly they have to stay aware of them so they can continue to be relevant for those who want to be on point with the seasons, fashions. I'm thankful, I guess, that recently thrifted items have become more popular. I feel like in the 90s, thrifting was kind of seen as a weird thing or because you maybe couldn't afford it. I think thrifting is a lot more affordable. It also keeps pieces of clothing in use for longer and most people do thrift in person I love the app and websites, a website too, Poshmark, because I can get used garments from companies that I know and love that might usually be out of my price range. Usually I still try to buy things like Athleta or Patagonia, B Corp certified companies, and then bonus, I'm buying them thrifted for less monies. I also, though, don't like, sometimes you gotta think about this one, that when you're buying a single item and paying shipping on a single item, the packaging that goes into it, yeah, guys, uh, progress over perfection. What can you do? I don't try to buy from Poshmark very frequently. I try to only buy those staple pieces that I'm going to use for years. Thrifting in your own town is obviously preferred as that's putting money back in the local economy and you didn't have to get it shipped to you. The last thing I'll talk about is more extensive transportation. When we're talking about air travel, I recently found an app called, oh, now I don't know what it's called. It's either Klima or Klima. I have a, a yoga student whose last name is Klima, but now I'm thinking it might be Klima, like climate. I don't know. It's spelled K-L-I-M-A, if you're curious. And it's actually a way to offset your own personal carbon footprint. So it goes through a series of questions, kind of like what I just listed here, 
what diet are you eating? Is it vegan? Is it vegetarian? Do you eat less meat? Are you super carnivore? How much do you travel? Do you drive to work? Are you a frugal shopper? Do you get most things thrifted? Or are you always looking for the latest fashions every single season? And then gives you a number at the end that shows you how you relate to the rest of the US, how you relate to the rest of the world. And will then at the end give you an option to offset your own carbon footprint. And the two categories, uh, no, three. The three that made my score a little lower than the average US citizen, thank you, thank you, no. <laughs> um, but still, still pretty high, kind of around that average mark was the fact that my fiance and I are just two people. We do not have children. We do not intend to have children. And our house is just under 1600 square feet, I think. So we live in a house as opposed to an apartment or a condo. And it's a two story house. We have a very, fairly significant footprint with the energy that we have to use just to heat our house and use the electricity that we need to work and to live and to enjoy ourselves. The other one was, as I mentioned before, I do not really have the most reliable bus routes that can get me from place to place, especially working as an independent contractor, as a yoga teacher and podcaster. I can't always wait an hour or two. If I get done with something at 10 o'clock and the bus picks up at 9.50, I might not have the time to wait around an hour for that next bus to loop through. I do plan on starting to ride my bike more now that the weather is nice. So I hope to report back that I have reduced my carbon footprint by lessening the miles that I drive. The third one though, circling back to where this conversation started, is typically when it's not pandemic times, we usually do take an international trip every year. And then in the past five years or so, I'd say about every year or every other year, we take a smaller trip, maybe to California to see some of my family or elsewhere for a music function or something involved with yoga. There's actually two questions on this, on the Klima or Klima app. One of which is how many round trips do you take that are less than three hours in length? And how many round trips do you take that are more than three hours in length? So I did mark that we're averaging about one of each every year. And if I did not have that international and domestic travel, I think my score would have been a lot lower, but I'm proud to say mine was still just below average, but I am looking for ways to improve that and lessen my carbon footprint. And if you're wondering toward the end there, if I were to offset my carbon footprint to be carbon neutral, it would cost me about $16 a month. Now I want to look into the app more to see where all of the money is going, what's going on. You can pick the causes that you want your offset to go through. And I'm sure there's more apps out there, more programs out there like this that I just haven't found yet. So. I'm gonna do a little more looking into uh, <laughs> offsetting my own personal carbon footprint and I will of course let you know my findings. If you'd like to hear more about climate neutrality, check into our next week's mini-sode. Every Thursday we come out with a new mini-sode. Every Tuesday we come out with a full-length episode with a guest covering anything from consumer packaged goods, innovation to public health. If you're not already, go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter to check out some of these things that I share. I'll be starting to share more apps and technology things that can help you on your sustainable journey. And I, of course, love to share some of my favorite products, what I use, what package-free items I use, what I'm listening to, what I'm reading, what I'm doing, how I'm enjoying myself. And I'm so glad. I know. <laughs> Here in the Midwest, we like to joke that we have like third winter, fake spring, second fake spring. I think we're in the first fake spring, but uh, we're getting there. It's pretty nice outside. I think I'm gonna go ride my bike or go for a walk right now, actually, guys. So I will see you later. Tune in next week to learn about climate neutral.